Are you feeling down? Of course, I mean if your bladder is falling. Well, what can you do? Stay tuned so I can inform you of what you need to do about your prolapse. I am Jeff McQuarrie, a Tennessee urogynecologist. If your prolapse and incontinence problems are dominating your life, take back control by solving your problems with solutions from my channel, Women's Healthcare Answers. Technically, what we call the bladder falling is a cystocele. This is also known as anterior vaginal wall prolapse. But just remember, it's not uncommon to have more than one type of prolapse at a time. And often you're told that when you go to your doctor. So don't be concerned if you have more than one thing going on. It's actually quite common. Stay till the end. Because what we're going to be talking about today is fixing a fallen bladder. And you need to know this information before you see your doctor so you can be better informed about your choices. Well, typically about 200,000 surgeries for bladder prolapse is done just in the U.S. alone every year. These types of problems tend to recur even after surgery about 40% of the time. So you need your surgery to be done well and your experienced surgeon needs to treat all your problems that you have during that one surgery. When you go to your gynecologist, they are going to stage your prolapse. And most of the time they are going to just look and see how far the bladder is falling. Along with the bladder, the urethra can fall, and this can lead to urinary leaking as well. If you have no problem, your bladder or your urethra should be at least three centimeters above the opening of the vagina. If your bladder is falling so that you can feel it, and you know it, it's at least the, at the vaginal opening, which we call this then a stage two prolapse. Well, as I talked about in other videos, there is a normal support for the front of the vagina and the bladder, and it's made of muscles and thick tissues that come from the cervix and is connected to the outer edges of the pelvic wall, where we call this the white line. A more fancy name for the white line is the arcus tendineus fascia pelvis, and that connection supports the upper two-thirds of the vagina. There is other muscular support for the outer third. You might be wondering though, at this point, well, how does this happen? We think that it's because you get tears in the strong tissues that should be holding the vagina. And uh, this is often because of childbirth, menopause, and repetitive heavy lifting or straining. You know, just daily life, right? These tears can be at the top, the sides or in the middle of the vagina. And it is very important for your surgeon to be able to identify exactly what type of defect you have in your tissues so that the appropriate tear is being fixed. These type of tears technically are called midline defects. That's the tear in the middle. Also, there's a perivaginal defect and that's a tear from one or both sides. And uh, this is from the white line I told you about earlier. So a more concerning defect that is not often seen prior to surgery is what's called an apical defect. And this tear is where the upper vagina or uterus is falling and dragging the upper vagina and bladder down. If that's not recognized at the time of surgery and fixed appropriately, you will have recurrence of your prolapse and be very dissatisfied with your procedure. So the typical symptoms of all these type of prolapse issues are a vaginal bulge, difficulty trying to pee, and you feel real hesitancy to get the stream going, and even recurrent UTIs can be an issue that can alert you to having real prolapse problems. But if you end up going to your doctor to be evaluated for this prolapse and they say it's not too bad, I would say that's not only true if you have very few of these problems I just mentioned. I feel it is very important to repair a prolapse if you are having significant symptoms. One counter to this though, is if you've not completed childbearing, repeat vaginal deliveries will possibly cause more problems that you will need to have fixed later again. So it's best really just to wait until you've had all your children. So if you like the video so far, hit the like button. It really helps with YouTube and please subscribe. Because if you miss any of my videos, who am I going to talk to? Just give me a thumbs up and please comment because I want 
to help answer your questions. So as I think I've made pretty clear, if you get evaluated and your doctor thinks you need surgery, they really need to evaluate for three main things. They need to know how bad your symptoms are. They need to know exactly what type of defect and problem you're having to be prepared or, or to be prepared to repair another defect if they find another problem at the time of surgery. But they also need to know if you're healthy enough to have surgery and they can evaluate for that. It is also important to be informed of the risk of bladder prolapse surgery, and we call this a consent for surgery. And those risks include damage to your bowel, to your bladder, to your ureters, or urethra. But they also include risk of infection, uh, bleeding, which may even lead to hematoma, which is a blood collection. You can also have increased urinary urgency and leakage after surgery, and you need to be told that. But you can also have post-operative pain or pain with intercourse that interferes, but also there's anesthesia risk as well. You can also have blood clots in your legs, and, the, and also the biggest thing, a long-term risk of failure up to 40% and need repeat surgery. So if you do undergo surgery, they'll typically when you get there, going to give you some antibiotics, which will be in your system while they do surgery, and this really decreases that risk for infection. Sometimes you're even gonna go home with a few days of antibiotics, and that will be really by your surgeon's preference. You may also do things that help to decrease your risk for blood clots in your legs, which we call a DVT. This may be no more than what we call intermittent pneumatic compression, which are the devices that squeeze your legs intermittently during surgery to keep the blood flowing. But we'll typically only uh, use those if you're gonna be in surgery for more than 20 to 30 minutes. So the surgery most commonly done is anterior coporophy, and this is commonly known as a bladder tack. Please remember what we talked about before, this is only done if you have a midline tear defect, Otherwise, it's really inappropriate and you need those other defects fixed if you have them. So the way this surgery is done is simply by separating the vaginal tissues from the bladder and finding where the tear is and pulling those good strong tissues back together. And this can typically be done with stitches that will absorb. We call those sutures. This typically will end up with excessive tissue that can be trimmed away so that you no longer have that bulge. Typically, I don't use mesh for this type of surgery, but a dermal graft, which is a skin graft to strengthen the tissues, can be used at the discretion of your surgeon. And But this also can be due to the extent of your bulge, according to the type of tear you have, or if it's a second or third surgery for your same problem. You want it to be fixed this time. If a defect is seen at the time of surgery, of the upper vagina or there is uterine prolapse and repair of that should also be done. And I will go into great detail uh, of that repair in further videos. So continue to watch my videos to understand more about how to repair all different types of pelvic prolapse defects. So after the surgery, you're typically gonna have vaginal packing, which is gauze in the vaginal area that is putting pressure on all those tissues that were opened up. You probably even have a urinary catheter to drain the urine because it's not uncommon to have difficulty trying to pee after surgery, especially within that first 24 hours. Now, I mostly do these surgeries outpatient, so my patients go home the same day, but you may very well stay overnight in the hospital and that's quite common. But you will be given antibiotics uh, very often, but sometimes not. Minimal pain medication is typically used, and ibuprofen can be very helpful in decreasing a lot of the inflammation and pain. I will also tell my patients to try to not do any heavy lifting over about 10 pounds, and try not to strain, especially with bowel movements, for about six weeks. You should be able to get back to fairly normal activities as long as you're not straining or lifting in just a few weeks. I really hope you do well. And hopefully, you feel you learned something. And as always, I've enjoyed being here with you. I would just love to continue to help solve your problems at Women's Healthcare Answers. 
Remember this video is meant for information purposes only. Please consult your own healthcare provider, but it's okay to reference the information I give you.